we'll open up the Zoom room around 11, 10 or so, and we can fellowship and well, share and laugh together oh till about uh, 11, 20. And then uh, we can start and we're continuing our plot line. We're, we're uh, heading out of the Old Testament finally. We, we're looking at David and the uh, Davidic covenant, which is huge, uh, almost as important as uh, the Mosaic covenant today. And then the new covenant next uh, week. And then after that, we're into John the Baptist and then the gospels with Jesus for about three or four sessions before our one of the epistles and then revelation uh to end it so we'll end in the uh, uh, end of uh april uh will end so uh, we'll, we'll continue this plot. and hopefully you're getting two sides of it the preaching side and the teaching side and hopefully they're complementing uh and enriching our experience of going through scripture so and i, I had a couple people outside of a church when they found out we're doing this uh comment that in one sense, it's it's uh, it's wonderful that we're going through the whole Bible, but in another sense, it is quite challenging trying to narrow down the material into these uh, 52 slots in preaching and in the Bible study, and then for three preachers to work together. So that's a test of uh, one-mindedness among the three of us who are, I think, pretty different. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that's good, too. Uh, let me start with, uh, with the screen. Let's see. Uh -huh. Here we go from the beginning. There we go. And so we are looking at the kingdom of God once again. And uh, as we look through this, the focus will be on David. We looked at Saul and David last week and the request for a king. And if you remember, it was always within the plan of God that there would be a human king or a, yeah, a human king. I put that in quotes, who will be a mediator of God's universal or sovereign reign. So it's always been as part of his plan. But when the Israelites asked for a king coming out of the ju uh, judges, they did so because they wanted that king to operate in the ways of the world. And that's why God was hesitant um, uh, or displeased with the request. And so we head into David, who is God's choice. Saul is the people's choice. David is God's choice, and we'll look at him and uh, the, uh, the covenant made to him. But just to pull back just a little bit, so the development of Israel. So if you were at the service, the closing lines of the sermon, I said the story of Israel is the story of God's redemption. The story of Israel is God's story of creation. And in many ways it is. So that if you look at Israel, it's hard to overemphasize Israel. Now, I know in Protestant evangelical circles, we don't really focus on the Old Testament that much, and we don't focus on Israel that much, and that's a shame because the amount of text that's devoted to Israel is more than any other single entity in Scripture. I'm direct reference and uh, direct speech about Israel is huge. In fact, Israel is the main vehicle through which God's redemption will occur. And when you come to the Gospels, you cannot understand the Gospels and the life of Jesus without going to the story of Israel. And so uh, that's, it's hugely important for us to uh, gain clarity on them. And so I just have this chart up there, the beginning, the family, Jacob has 12 sons, right? So it's a family, it's a way in the beginning. And in a sermon today, Jacob is given the name Israel. So that's what the beginning of the origins of Israel in terms of a people group. And then they become a confederation of 12 tribes, especially when they go into Egypt uh, from the famine. And then as they grow there, uh, Exodus 1 says that they were fruitful and multiplied using that language and from Genesis 1. And so it's a confederation of 12 tribes. And then with the giving of the law in Mount Sinai, they become an official nation. And at this point, God is their mediating king as well as the sovereign rule, sovereign ruler. And then from there, they request the king and then Saul becomes the first king. And he's sort of a, uh, a teaching moment that if you have a bad king on the throne, things will not go well for the nation. So this is one of the things to remember as we read scripture, as the king goes, so does the nation. The measurement for how well the king goes 
is his ability to replicate the reign of God over the world in the reign over the nation. That's how it's measured. And so when you have a righteous king, the land is blessed. And I know I did this way in the beginning, but that's the Lion King theme. And they do it beautifully, right? When you have a wicked king on the throne, the land is cursed. When you have a righteous king on the throne, you have prosperity and blessedness in the land. And so David is uh, God's choice. And when David is on the throne, a righteous king, what you have is blessedness in the land. And then all of these promises uh, and sequence is pointing towards the messianic kingdom. They're looking for a future son of David who will reign over the entire world through Israel. And so under God's reign, this king, the king, will be mediating God's reign. And so hang on to that. That's where we're headed with the gospel. And then we want to take a look here. So you have the universal reign of God, a universal redemption. So he's healing or reversing the effects of Adam's uh, eating of the fruit. And the main characters are Abraham and then Moses, David. And then the Messiah are the main mediators of the covenant through which God will reverse the uh, effects of the fall from chaos back to order. And the first exodus, so uh, the Israelites being led out of Egypt into the promised land and the shedding of the blood of the lamb and putting it on the doorpost, all of that is the first exodus. And the Bible, especially Isaiah, uses the first exodus as a model for the second exodus or the final exodus where uh, Israel, these would be all the nations who are in Jesus Christ. So that's Israel in quotes, who will be led out of the world through uh, the blood of Jesus, the lamb that takes away the sins of the world. And we are being led out of uh, the world into the wilderness, headed towards the promised land. That's New Jerusalem, uh, Revelation 21 and 22. Now, the church right now, you and I, we're part of this new exodus, and we are in that uh, the wilderness stage. So we're aliens and strangers and sojourners in this world as we're being led by uh, the Messiah into the promised land. So we're waiting for Jesus to return so that we can enter into the promised land. So the thing to remember is when we look at metaphors for salvation, the primary biblical metaphor for God's deliverance is Exodus. That's the imagery, not the lifeboat imagery. So, you know, I, I see that here and there within evangelical theology where, you know, the world is going to hell, but uh, the church is like the lifeboat and we're trying to uh, pull people into the lifeboat. And then one day God will sort of, uh, oh, James T. Kirk. So he will um, transport <laughs> the, the boat uh, into heaven, sort of. And, you know, while there's some truth to that, the more proper metaphor is the Exodus one. And when we come to the Gospels, we will see how the writers portray Jesus as the new Moses leading his disciples from the world into the promised land. And so that's the better metaphor. Now, the point one, there's three points here. The primary responsibility of the king is righteousness and justice. That's the two primary. It's not building military uh, armies or making chariots or saving money uh, in the treasury. It's righteousness and justice. I want to talk about that a little bit because that's how the future son of David king will be recognized. The messianic king will be re recognized by how well he uh, delivers justice and how righteous he is. So the primary responsibility of the king is righteousness, justice. Now, uh, in the Greek New Testament, it's the same Greek word that's translated for righteousness and justice, because there's a lot of overlap, but in the Hebrew, it's two different words, one for righteousness and one for justice, but they overlap. So there are a lot of passages in the Old Testament where it says justice and righteousness, because there's overlap. But if we wanted to tease them apart, Righteousness has a little bit more to do with personal holiness, your relationship to God. And then justice has a little bit more emphasis upon social responsibility, my relationship to my neighbor. So that if I'm in the middle, righteousness is my outward direction. 
justice in terms of loving others is my neighbors. I am my neighbor's keeper, my brother's keeper. And then there's a third component that we don't really stress, and that's justice in terms of caring for creation. That's part of our covenantal obligation so that we are to guard it and to keep it, to work it. So that we have this uh, three dimensions, horizontal, vertical, and then downward uh, as well. And so this would fit well with all of the commandments that's given to Moses and to the Israelites when you uh, summarize it into just two, right? You, you guys are familiar, love God and love others. And I, I would like to put in there and care for creation as well, but certainly a secondary obligation compared to loving God and love others. So that's the greatest commandment that's given there and it's connected so that if you have righteousness, you will have justice. And when you have justice, you will usually have righteousness. Because if you have justice without righteousness, then all you are is a secular social uh, outreach program. But in terms of God's scheme, if you are righteous, you have to be justice because that's part of God's desire for you. And if you are just, just, that's a reflection of your holiness before God. In the same way here, if you love God, you have to love others. It's connected. In fact, 1 John right, chapter 3, if you love God but don't love your brother, it doesn't work that way. But if you love others and you truly love them, it's because God poured out his love into your heart to love others. So they're deeply connected, even though you can tease them apart a little bit. And so David is a man of personal holiness. So he is righteous. And this slide comes from last week when we compare Saul to David, in terms of the world's perspective, David's a greater sinner, but David is a man after God's own heart because his heart is right with God. He is one who has a deep desire to know God, who worships God, sings after him. And so he is a man after God's own heart. He's righteous. But David must also uh, deliver justice. So royal justice, in other words, from the throne, David needs to make decisions that are just, that reflects God's just nature. The way God reigns, David is supposed to reign as well by the decisions and judgments that he makes. So that here, if you see God in his rule over the world, it's a just rule. On the right side, the king who mediates God's justice must reign over his realm. So let's say uh, David over Israel in a just manner so that it images. So that David is to reign as God reigns or to image God's reign. So you're mediating, reflecting uh, that reign. And so uh, that's the primary responsibility. Is the king's heart right with God, righteousness? And does he organize his realm in such a way that there is a peace and harmony between the individuals that live within it? Is it a just society? Those are the two primary responsibilities. Now, so I have several texts here, Bible texts, and these Bible texts can be multiplied quite a bit, but I'm going to read some of this. And so uh, this is Psalm 72. Give the king your justice, O God, right? This is sort of like we have the righteousness of Christ. The king is supposed to have the justice of God. So give the king your justice, O God, and your righteousness to the royal son. So you have a father-son type of relationship between the mediating king and God. And verse 2, may he judge your people with righteousness and, with your, and your poor with justice. Let the mountains bear prosperity for the people and the hills in righteousness. May he defend the cause of the poor of the people, give deliverance to the children of the needy, and crush the oppressor. And so that's one of the primary responsibilities is a just society. And then two, uh, three verses later on in Psalm 72, for he delivers the needy when he calls, when the needy cry out, the king responds, the poor and him who has no helper, he has pity on the weak and the needy and saves the lives of the needy. From oppression and violence, he redeems their life. So from the rich and the powerful who oppress their lives, and precious is their blood in his sight. And this is still the king who uh, expresses the justice of God within his realm. And then here's another one. And this I find this very interesting because if you really uh, read First Samuel, you have Hannah who is barren, and Hannah cries out, and then God gives her a son. And Hannah has a prayer 
And Hannah's prayer was long. It's almost as long as Deborah's prayer in Exodus, I think, 15. And Hannah is not a major figure within the plot line. She's just a barren woman. Now, she does give birth to Samuel, but her prayer is recorded in quite detail. And I think the reason why is because it shows us what kind of king is supposed to be on the throne, because first Samuel obviously leads to the request for a king, and then Saul, and then David. So there is none holy like the Lord, for there is none beside you, for there is no rock like our God. Talk no more so very proudly. Let not arrogance come from your mouth. For the Lord is the God of knowledge, and by him actions are weighed. Now, verse 4 and on. The bows of the mighty are broken, and the feeble bind on strength. They're wrapped, they're uh, garmented with the strength. And then verse 5. Those who are full have hired themselves out for bread, but those who are hungry have ceased to hunger, that is, uh, even as I share this, I'm thinking of, uh, is that Zechariah or, oh, the parable. Zechariah is the one that uh, is in the uh, Sheol and, uh, oh, there, he's the beggar and then there's a the rich man and the reversal occurs in the afterlife. Uh, and so we have this sort of reversal that's occurring between those who are on top and those who are on the bottom. And then the last line, the baron has born seven, but she who has many children is forlorn. So if you don't have children, you're barren, you become an outcast and the reversal occurs. And then the Lord kills and brings to life. He brings down to Shu and raises up. And then verse seven, the Lord makes poor and makes rich. He brings low and he exalts. He raises up the poor from the dust. He lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with princes and inherit a seat of honor. The continual theme of the reversal from the rich and the poor, the powerful and the weak. This is still Hannah's prayer. And then look at the very end, the last two lines. Uh, the Lord will judge the ends of the earth. He will give strength to his king and exalt the horn of his anointed. And this is before the king is even requested in uh, First Samuel, I don't know, three or four, chapter three or four. And so what we have here is the foreshadowing of the throne, Israel will ask for a king, and the king that they ought to ask for is one who does righteousness and justice. But instead, Israel asked for a king who was mighty in power, a head taller than everyone, strong, powerful, and who will develop an army. So it's the wrong way in which the king is supposed to reign. And so, and then now I have Jeremiah 22. So this is the prophets and the king, the prophets and the king's justice. I'm just sharing how strong this thing theme is. And this, uh, the word of the Lord comes down to the house of uh, Judah, to the king, to the king of Judah. And uh, verse three, oh no, thus says the Lord, do justice and righteousness, and deliver from the land of the oppressor him who, from the hand of the oppressor him who has been robbed. And do no wrong or violence to the resident alien that's among your midst, the fatherless and the widow, nor shed innocent blood in this place. This is God's commandments to the king. This is how he is supposed to rule. So, uh, Jeremiah 22, later on. Woe to him who builds his house by unrighteousness and his upper rooms by injustice. In other words, by taking advantage of labor, slave labor, not paying them enough. Who makes his neighbor serve him for nothing and does not give him his wages. Who says, I will build myself a great house with spacious upper rooms, who cuts out windows windows for it, paneling a cedar and painting it with vermilion. He's doing all of these wonderful building projects, yet he's not taking care of the builders and the laborers. And then the next two verses, do you think you are a king because you compete in cedars? I like that. Do you think you're a king because uh, you have the mightiest chariots and the biggest, um, um, Oh, uh, mansions and uh, throne. No, uh, did not your father eat and drink and do justice and righteousness? See, that's what makes you a king by doing justice and righteousness. Then it was well with him. He judged the cause of the poor and needy. Then it was well. Is not this to know me? And that's a crucial line there. See, that's righteousness to know God and then justice taking care of the poor are overlap. They're connected. So that if you say you know God, but don't care, take care of the poor, then you really don't know God. And once again, this is 1 John chapter 3. How can you say you love God when you don't love your brother? It's connected together for the citizens of God's kingdom as well as the king himself. But he's the one 
that is supposed to model it and then render judgment upon his realm so that uh, justice reigns. Now, uh, the, the last one, and I'm still, it's the same thing, but I want to do this because it's Bathsheba and the king's justice. Because you know that Bathsheba, uh, Bathsheba scene, uh, he looks out on the window and sees a, a woman bathing and he's enticed and he falls into temptation. When Nathan comes to call out King David, he does it not in terms of his adultery, not in terms of his murder, but in terms of his injustice. And I find that fascinating. So if you look at verse four and on, you know, this is Nathan's story about the rich man that comes and uh, he's got all this sheep and this poor man who had this one sheep that he treats like a family member. And this rich man oppresses the poor man by taking his one sheep. So look at verse four. Now there came a traveler to the rich man, a traveler to the rich man. He was unwilling to take one of his own flock or herd to prepare for the guests who had come to him. But he took the poor man's lamb and prepared it for the man who had come to him. See, this is an act of injustice. And when Nathan, and when David gets all riled up, right? He's angry at this rich man. Nathan said to David, you are the man. This is what you did. Because Adultery occurs as a husband. Murder occurs as a human being. You murder another human being. But David as king, his primary responsibility was to do justice. And by stealing the one wife of Uriah, he was committing an act of injustice. And that's what Nathan is calling him out. And this is what God is calling him out for, because the primary responsibility of a king is righteousness and justice. So I just want to hammer that point home. And then later on, the rest of uh, 1 Samuel and 2 Samuel, uh, what you see is his sins that he has committed with Bathsheba keeps coming back and haunting him so that his life becomes more tragic as it goes on. Let's see. And then, uh, let's. oh, I'm sorry, let's go back. Oh. And then uh, here, what you see, the judgment made, made on David, and the Lord gave victory to David wherever he went. So David reigned over all Israel, and David administered justice and equity to all his people. I think he was a king that was faithful in terms of his primary responsibility to the people, which definitely did not mean that he was perfect with the whole Bathsheba uh, incident. But uh, in terms of his kingliness, uh, he was faithful in administering justice and equality. Uh, and the result of a just king and a righteous king is two things. You have peace in the land, right? So even in the verse before, when the king is righteous, God will protect them from neighboring armies, enemies. And then the second thing is they will have prosperity. The land will be fruitful and it'll rain, and uh, uh, they'll be blessed with crops. So you have peace from insecurity from other armies, and then prosperity from hunger, their needs will be met. That's the two end result of a righteous king. So that uh, in general, you know that a king is righteous and just when the land is flourishing. And that's the setup, because when you come to um, uh, the Messiah, the son of David, Jesus Christ, when he's fully on the throne of God, not partial, but fully on the throne of God, then land will flourish in an abundant way. And Isaiah talks of how flourishing that will be when, uh, uh, when a planter plants the seed, the harvester has to follow right behind them because the land will produce such abundant fruit. Okay, so that's the structure. And then David's kingdom, they call it the golden age, way on top left, I'm sorry but that's the golden age of Israel. See that purple area? That's David's kingdom. And that's the furthest extent of his kingdom drawn uh, his reign so that when people think of uh, the king of Israel, they think of David as the model or the standard. He's the gold standard. In fact, uh, uh, no, I'll keep going. King David becomes the hope for a greater King David so that out of his line will come uh, a king who will reign with even greater justice and righteousness. And this is the Davidic covenant that's made. And so we're going to work on through this a little bit slow from verse uh, 8, 2 Samuel chapter 7. And this is a covenant that is made just like covenant was made to uh, Moses. Now, therefore, thus you shall say to my servant David, thus says the Lord of hosts, 
I took you from the pasture from following the sheep. Now, this is important here because if you ask why did God choose Israel? Well, it's not because they were the most powerful nation, not because they were the most numerous people, if you remember that. And in the same way, David was a, a shepherd. He's the youngest son. And in fact, when Samuel came, uh, David's father didn't even call him from the field. So he's the youngest. And this is the reversal, the youngest becoming king, the reversal that you should be prince over my people Israel. And I've been with you wherever you went and have cut off all your enemies from before you. And I will make you a great name. So that flows out of the Abrahamic promise, right? I will make your name great, like the names of the great ones of the earth. And I will appoint a place for my people Israel and will plant them. So this is the land part of the promise made to Abraham that's fulfilled in, with uh, uh, Moses and the giving of the law. So that they may dwell in their own place and be uh, disturbed no more. And violent men shall afflict them no more as formerly from the time that I appointed judges. That so the whole judges scene that you won't have this constant cycle of foreign nations coming and oppressing the people of Israel. And I will give you rest from all your enemies. This is the rest of shalom um, that comes when you have a righteous king on the throne. Moreover, the Lord declares to you that the Lord will make you a house. Now, that's a dynasty. So if we keep reading the next few verses, when your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you who shall come from your body and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, Solomon, building a temple for God. And I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. This is an everlasting covenant. I will be to him a father and he shall be to me a son. Now, this is crucial. It's not just God and a king that's mediating. It's a father who will have his son mediate. Now, uh, to me, this is very similar to Adam, who is a son of God, who is mediating the reign of God over uh, God's kingdom. When he commits iniquity, I will discipline him with the rod of men, with the stripes of the sons of men. But my steadfast love will not depart from him. In other words, his household, as I took it from Saul. In other words, Saul's sons did not become king. Jonathan did not become king. But for David, in his line, when individual kings fail to be righteous and just, God will not bless, but God will not never remove the promise of a son of David sitting upon the throne. That's an eternal promise whom I have put away from before you and your house and your kingdom shall be made sure at anchor. The foundations will be firm forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. So this is the promise that the Israelites cling to so that what they're waiting for is a descendant of David who will sit upon the throne, who will display righteousness and justice to such a magnitude that the people can hope for a kingdom that is flourishing that's the hope now uh if we come to here um, i have this in here because all future sons of david that's sitting upon the throne they're judged by how close their reign is to the reign of david now um, read this yellow section with me because you see the covenant being played out and he walked in all the sins as king uh Jer jeroboam and he walked in all the sins that his father did before him and his heart was not wholly true to the Lord, his God, righteousness, as the heart of David, his father. Nevertheless, for David's sake, the Lord, his God, gave him a lamp in Jerusalem, setting up his son after him and establishing uh, Jerusalem. In other words, the descendants will continue to come from David, even though individual kings will not be blessed when they do not display righteousness and justice. Verse 5, because God did what was right. Oh, sorry, because David did what was right in the eyes of the Lord and did not turn aside from anything that he had commanded him all the days of his life, except in the matter of Uriah the Hittite, because David was faithful. God made this promise that his descendants will sit upon the throne forever, except in the matter of Uriah the Hittite. Now, what we have in Jesus Christ is a son of David who will sit on the throne except he will be perfectly righteous. There will be no Bathsheba incident in the life of Jesus. And that's the hope, a completely righteous and just king. 
Now, the last point, we're almost done. In Jesus, all the promises to Abraham are fulfilled. And so this is where we're headed. Next week, we'll do the new covenant. That's crucial. And then we, uh, the week after, we start pick up with John the Baptist. You have to study John the Baptist before you study Jesus because he's the forerunner making the pathway straight. We have to, have to understand what is the message of John the Baptist because that's linked to the message of Jesus. And so in Abraham's promise, that's where it all starts, right? This is the redemptive movement of God, not recreation, but redemption. And Abraham, the promise made to him is fulfilled in Moses. The people become uh, multiplied and then land is given through Moses, the promised land. And then in David, you have uh, the, uh, the kingdom of God because you have a king now. You go from a nation to a kingdom. And then the new covenant is the spirit where God will reside in his people so that their righteousness and justice flows through God's grace, not through their human effort. In the same way that uh, Psalmist writes in Psalm 72, oh God, give your justice to the king. In the same way, in the New Testament, when the new covenant is ratified, you can say, oh God, give your righteousness to your people through the spirit and your justice through the spirit. The spirit of God is the one who will reproduce the fruits of the spirit, which includes righteousness and justice that belongs to God himself. In other words, we're, we're not called to love people with their own love. We're called to love people with the love of God. Same thing with justice. We don't, we're not socially responsible with our own sense of justice, but instead we reflect the justice of God through us into our society. And the spirit of God is the one that channels it. And that's why when you look at the church, you're supposed to see something that's not quantitatively better, but qualitatively better. And that is so crucial because the church is called to love the world with the love of Jesus. And the love of Jesus is qualitatively different than the love that the human beings can reproduce. So that in Jesus, you have the new Moses, and we're going to have a whole section on this. But just as uh, Moses went up to the mountain and he brought the laws down, in the same way, Jesus went up to a mountain and he gave the law of the kingdom, someone on the mount. He, he is Israel. And that's why he goes into Egypt and comes back out. And there's a lot of uh, connections that we'll look at in a few weeks. And then Jesus is ideal Israel so that his history is being played out. Israel's history is being played out in Jesus. They're both exiled into Egypt. Right? Both have to be in Egypt. And then they both survive infanticide with Herod in the New Testament and Pharaoh in the Old both experienced life-changing water experience with the splitting of the Red Sea and Jesus being baptized in the Jordan River. They're both led by the Spirit. The Israelites led by fire at night and cloud by day into the Promised Land. And then uh, Jesus is led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted, just like Israel was tempted in the wilderness for 40 days, reflecting the 40 years. And then the temptation for 40 years and then delivers the law on a mountain, just like Moses did. So uh, the history of Israel is being played out in the history of Jesus. Now, I cannot overemphasize this, even though I've already done it in a sermon in here. We must understand what God is doing through Israel because Israel's history is not over. It's still being played out in Jesus, who is the new Moses, new Israel, who is King David sitting upon the throne. And so uh, we need to be careful not to forget Israel. And then the Davidic kingdom, right? This is the Palm Sunday and the crowds that went before him and that followed him were shouting Hosanna to the son of David, right? He has come. This is a son of David who will reign with perfect righteousness and justice. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And then this is the new covenant. So that Jesus says, look, uh, I, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper, the spirit of God will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. In Jesus, the Mosaic covenant will be fulfilled. In Jesus, the Davidic covenant will be fulfilled. And in Jesus, the new covenant, the spirit of God coming and dwelling in the hearts will be fulfilled. In other words, in Jesus, all the Abrahamic 
promises will be fulfilled. Uh, and this is my last verse. And this is what the, I believe Paul means in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20, when he says, for all the promises of God find their yes in him, in Jesus. All the promises God made is fulfilled in Jesus Christ because he brings to uh, fulfillment the Mosaic, the Davidic, and the New Covenant. That is why it is through him that we utter our amen to God. Amen to God. <laughs> truly, truly, God is faithful. Uh, and for his glory. And so that brings us to an end uh, to the Davidic covenant. Next week, we'll look at the new covenant, uh, which takes us into the New Testament as Jesus ratifies it through communion. And then, uh, oh, and next week we're serving, uh, we are celebrating communion as well. So the timing works out really well. And then after that, John the Baptist, we're going to look at John the Baptist and then the life of Jesus for about three or four sessions uh, to see how the kingdom is uh, uh, culminated, yeah, uh, consummated in the person of Jesus Christ. Thank you um, for joining. And uh, it's 1155. And so, and weather's not as nice today, but I hope you have a wonderful. Oscar David, uh, yeah. I have a question here. These two. Uh -huh. Can I ask oh, a question? No. Yeah, yes. before you close. <laughs> so, no, I'm sorry. I, you know what? I can't keep not naming the question. Yeah. yeah, I have a question here. Uh-huh. Hey, I, I, uh, there's one slide you show with Abraham, the relationship between Abraham, David, and Jesus, right? And through the spirit and Moses. Yes, yeah. Right yeah. In the middle. Hey, I just, I, I probably missed something, you know, uh, what you explain in English because I do not. So I just want to add, I, I was thinking that Abraham through spirit, uh, spirit and then go to Jesus. How this go? I thought it was a God, a spirit, and then Jesus. That's a three. Oh, I'm Jesus sorry. This like me give me some reason that yeah. Can you? Explain? Oh yes. I, I'm sorry. Uh, the spirit is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. Yes. And yeah. How it come from Abraham? Oh, no, I, I'm just saying that when the Holy Spirit is sent, the new covenant is found in the promises made to Abraham. So when God made the promises to Abraham, mm -hmm. those promises are fulfilled through these three covenants. And in the new covenant, the promise is a new heart and a changed spirit. And the spirit of God is the one that enables that to occur. Yeah, of course. Yeah, that I understand, of course. Yeah. Yes, understand. Maybe oh, okay. you should go back to the that slide with the uh, well, arrow. Uh, Ada, before you go here, uh, I just tell uh, Pastor David I understand his explanation through that, but I I missed you know something in the slide. I mean because Abraham to the spirit and then Jesus. That's what I mean. Oh uh, yeah, uh, no. yeah. See that the point uh, you explain, I understood. Okay. Yeah. So you know what. Next week, when I do the new covenant, I'll make sure I trace it through the spirit back to Abraham so that it just clarifies for everybody. Oh, so the spirit can, the God go to the Abraham, that's then through the Abraham, the spirit come to Jesus. That in one. terms of the promises. In terms of oh, the promise, yeah. Of yeah. yeah. That I understand. The promise right. go all the way, yeah, the kingdom. Right. Yeah. You know, it actually, it's my fault. I should have put new covenant instead of spirit. But because I had Moses and David, I felt like yeah, I, I saw this is an <laughs> yeah. Okay, so <laughs> then my uh, thought, second sorry. question. I have a second question here. So the last two slides that, that you say the new covenant with the Jesus, right? That's a slide from the bottom, the second one. Uh huh. The second one. I, I missed the a, the chapter book chap which book you oh. only give the a verse you know which word, but not the book. I just try to get a this. Script. See the slide. If you could show the slide, or you know, yeah. And actually, in and and back one and uh, further. Yeah, this one. Oh, oh I, I believe that's John fourteen. I'm so John fourteen. Oh, John fourteen. Yeah. Actually, yeah. by the way, I want to add one comment here. And uh, it was a very good, you know, inspiration sermon you gave. Some of the slide you gave do not have a chapbook chapter, just a word. 
Yes. For me, it's a little bit difficult. Sometimes I, I want to look at that even in Chinese because then I could not immediately find it. So it would you know, be that's helpful a good point, if Quinn. A, you know, the book chapter is just at the word. Yeah. No, you know what? I will put the book and chapter on each of the slides. Yeah, yeah. So I know some of them have, some of them without. And then, you know, if I'm not familiar with this, where it come from, it takes me a while to find. It. Right. Thank you. And I, I will do that. And then uh, for Bible studies, I'll try to do that for everyone as well. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Are you still in Boston? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. And that was a great sermon yeah, this Sunday and previous Sunday. And Thank you. For uh, uh, thank you. You Very blessed me, uh, brother. Thank you. All right, everyone. Uh, I will hopefully see you next week and have a, a, a great uh, week and a good, good lunch. So thank you.